So today we're finishing up our summer series, Kingdom Life. And just to review a little bit, um, if you've been here this summer tracking with us, listening, um, then you've gotten plenty of information to act on and to live out the life that we have in Christ. And you've had plenty of information given about our new identity in Christ. Um, we've seen that we have a new identity in Jesus because what He's done, not because of what we've done, we don't define that God declares it for us. He makes it possible through what Jesus did, through His payment, His suffering in our place on the cross so that we could be part of God's family, that we could be part of His kingdom, that we could be His ambassadors. We've seen that and we've realized we don't work for that. We merely live out what God has already declared and given to us in Jesus. And we've seen throughout the summer also that that identity that we have in Jesus is rooted in who God himself is, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so we've seen and we've kind of fleshed that out over the last several weeks, last couple of months, that we are family because God is our Father. We are servants because Jesus is a servant king. We are sent as ambassadors for God into the world to give the good news because the Holy Spirit was sent to us and Jesus sends, sends us out under the power and enablement and direction of the Holy Spirit. So our identity under God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is we, our family of servants sent as ambassadors to the world around us. And we're to live that out every day, not just for a couple hours a week, not just when our schedule has some cracks in it that we can fit it in. We're to live that out. That's to be central to who we are and how we live every day. Now, I struggle with that. Do you? Do you ever struggle with that? Are, have you been on point every day this week? <laughs> Me either. So I have to keep going back to these truths. And if you've been here most of the summer, you'll remember uh, the first Sunday in June we had communion. We started off this series with a kingdom meal, communion. And our message was kind of focused around that. Today, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to bookend it. And so today, we're going to look again, but this time, slightly different twist, a kingdom feast. Kingdom feast. Still going to be communion, still going to be a meal, but um, kingdom feast. And we'll see that as we go through this morning. I want to read to you from the prophet Isaiah. This was written centuries before Jesus was here on earth. And this is what the prophet said. He had a message from God to share with God's people, the people of Israel. And this is what the prophet wrote down. O oh Lord, I will honor and praise your name, for you are my God. You do such wonderful things. You planned them long ago, and now you have accomplished them. You turn mighty cities into heaps of ruins. Cities with strong walls are turned to rubble. Beautiful palaces and distant lands disappear and will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong nations will declare your glory. Ruthless nations will fear you. But you are a tower of refuge to the poor, O Lord, a tower of refuge to the needy in distress. You are a refuge from the storm and a shelter from the heat. For the oppressive acts of ruthless people are like a storm beating against a wall or like the relentless heat of the desert. But you silence the roar of foreign nations. As the shade of a cloud cools relentless heat, so the boastful songs of ruthless people are stilled. In Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. There he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. In that day, the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. In this passage, this message that the prophet has for the people, he said God is going to celebrate the overthrow of wicked and ruthless people. And he's also going to demonstrate that the gloom and shadow of death have been destroyed. And how does he do that? With a feast for his people, great food. And he's going to sit down and we're going to enjoy this feast together with our God who has saved us and done all these things. Then, and if you want to turn with me, you could 
Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, I'm going to start in verse 6. And if you don't have an app on your device that you can queue it up in, or if you don't have your own print Bible, you should be able to find a Bible under your chair or a chair in front of you. And in those Bibles, we'll be on page 1039, 1039. I'll give you a moment to get there as we read this. Isaiah wrote what he wrote about this upcoming feast somewhere in the distant future that God's going to prepare for his people to celebrate his victory over his enemies, ruthless, wicked people, even the gloom and despair of death. He's going to throw this huge feast. It's going to be scrumptious. And then... Centuries later, another prophet, John, who was one of the 12 disciples, a follower of Jesus, gets a vision from God about what's going to happen in the future when time as we know it comes to an end. And so this hasn't happened yet. And that's what we're going to read, just a little, little chunk of this and see what, what God reveals to John. So Revelation 19, starting with verse 6. Then I, this is John, heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So Isaiah, centuries before, says, God's going to throw this huge feast, a celebration, to celebrate his victory. And then John, given a vision of what's going to happen at the end of time as we know it, says, yes, he repeats it, but gives a little more detail. He's a little more specific. He said, there's going to be a great feast. But this feast has a purpose. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb, God the Son, Jesus, when He's reunited with His bride, His people, the church. And we're going to sit down together in God's kingdom and enjoy this huge feast. And He says, and if you, if you can get, get an invite to that, that's good. Blessed are you. If you can be invited to this feast, it's going to be awesome. You're going to love it. Jesus related it this way while he was here on earth. So if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. I'm starting with verse 1. And again, if you're using a, a Bible from under the chairs, we'll be on page 827. Matthew 22. Jesus is telling a story here about the kingdom of heaven, about God's kingdom. When God's Rule and reign on earth is fully realized and things are returned to the way they're supposed to be. So, verse 1 says, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Okay, is the symbolism pretty clear here? Based on what we just saw John write? Who's the king? God the Father. Who's the son? Jesus, God the Son. So he says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. We're in cattle country. We know what this means. This is a good feast, right? Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. When the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, 
but few are chosen. Jesus tells a story. It, it, it's right in line with what Isaiah wrote, what John writes after Jesus left this earth physically. He says, yes, the kingdom of heaven, there's going to be a great wedding feast. The king, the, the great king, the father, is going to hold this for his son as he's united with his bride, the church. He says, and it's going to be great. He says, you know, it's not the people that you think would show up. The people that you would think most likely to respond to this invitation are the ones that often pay no attention. Or worse yet, take the messengers that are delivering the invitation and abuse them, even kill them. Just treat them horribly. And so he gives us a little bit of um, insight into what, what's going to happen with those people that are his servants. But I want to just look for a minute. At the end, he has this little blip in there about a guy that shows up. He's, he comes, so the king says, just invite whoever. The invitation's open to everybody. Get whoever you want. And they invite a bunch of people. But when they get there, one guy is not dressed properly. He doesn't come in the right attire. You've got, you got to have the right clothes to be at the king's wedding feast. So what, what is this about? Why is this in here? It's very consistent. Jesus did nothing um, without purpose to it. He's a master teacher. He knows what he's going to reveal. And in a couple of the letters that God had written to the early church, we find, I think, very clear explanation of what this clothing bit is talking about. I'm going to read a couple passages to you. Galatians 3, 26 through 27. For you, that's us that are followers of Jesus, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Ephesians 4, 21 through 24, we find this. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. In Jesus' parable, and he appoints to this wedding feast, this marriage supper of the Lamb, it's going to be this grand celebration. He says, but you've got to have the right clothes. What are the proper clothes for eating at the king's table to be present at the feast and enjoy it with them? The clothes provided by his son, the bridegroom. He says, you can't make them yourself. You can't go out and purchase them for yourself. They have to be given to you by the Son himself, Jesus Christ. He will put you in the righteousness of his that's going to allow us to sit at that feast, not just as guests, but as his bride, who it's focused around. It's focused around the bridegroom and his bride. So that's what you need to get in. And Jesus, in that little parable, says, listen, as servants, because we're, we're a family of servants, sent as ambassadors, so we have this message, this invitation for people. He says, but in that little story in Matthew, he said, you're going to face some bad times. You're going to face some rough times. You're going to face some persecution. You're going to have people not pay attention. They'll just ignore you, say, I'm too busy. I've got my own stuff going on. Or they might even abuse you. They might take advantage of you. They might even kill you because they're just angry and upset and it makes no sense. He says, but that's going to come too. Be aware of that. But don't forget what the end is, being present at this wedding feast. Jesus also tells us because we are his family of servants sent as ambassadors, our mission, we're in that story, that parable that Jesus told, as the servants, our mission is to invite others to the feast. This is the ministry of reconciliation. And we have not only the ministry of reconciliation, but the message of reconciliation. I'm going to review that a little bit this morning because, unfortunately, many times, those of us who I would call churched, reg people that regularly attend church services like this, and there's nothing wrong with this, this is great, but often we get this idea that the ministry and message of rec reconciliation is for the people standing up, on, up front. That's not what the Bible says. Some of us think, oh, my job is to invite people to come to church. No. It's okay if you do that. I'm not telling you you can't do that. But listen, listen carefully. 
That's not the ministry or message of reconciliation. It's to invite them to the wedding feast of the Lamb, Jesus the Savior. It's to tell them the good news about Jesus. Think about that. I've been, I've been thinking about this the last few weeks. In the last month, in the last year, how many times have I talked to somebody about the message of reconciliation with Jesus? Have I done it? It doesn't mean I've shared all the good news about Jesus, but have, am I thinking about, okay, God, today, who might I give the invitation to? Who might I prep for this? Wow, if you can't remember it, it's not good, right? If that's what our main job is, as family of servants sent as ambassadors, if that's what I'm supposed to be living out and I can't remember last time I was on task, it's not a good thing. The message of reconciliation. What is the gospel, the good news about Jesus? Well, first, it's nice to have the bad news so it gives a good clear setting. The bad news is this, God created us and declared an identity for us that we as human beings walked away from. We said, we don't trust you, God. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to create our own identity. And he said, that's not going to work because I'm your creator. <laughs> and when I do stuff, it's done well and it's good and I've designed it to work. And when you try to do something else, it's not going to work. And that's what we would very you know, often in church call sin. But it's a, it's a lot bigger than just like, oh, I, I, I said a bad word or I wasn't as kind as I should have been. No, it's not living life as God intends for us, not living out the identity he declared for us. He said, there's no way for you and I to fix that, to get back right again. Well, I'm going to be gooder. No, you can't do that. I'm going to go to church more. Well, that's not going to do it. He says, I'm the only one that can do it for you as your creator. So then the good news comes in, the message of reconciliation. The fact that Jesus, God the Son, came and lived on earth. He was born without a human father, so he didn't have that bent away from God, that sin nature in him. He was born without sin, unlike you and I. Then he lived life for 33 years, more or less, constantly listening to the Father, constantly depending on the Holy Spirit to always make the right choice, to always live in whatever circumstance he found himself in, the way that God the Father intended him to live. Then he went to the cross and suffered in my place and your place, paid the penalty for sin because sin requires death and shedding of blood. He did that for us, stayed dead three days physically, then rose again and stayed here on earth and went back to the Father, whatever that means. He left the earth physically. And he did that so that you and I could now be made right with God. What's our part in that? This is also good news. We just accept it. We just believe that God did what he said he did through Jesus. I go, I'm trusting that. I'm trusting that and nothing else. Nothing else makes me right with God. That's it, Jesus. And now I have a new identity. I'm his child. I'm his servant. I have a job to do. I'm sent as an ambassador, and I'm going to live that out now because of what Jesus has done. I'm not earning my way with God. I'm not making him love me more. He's done it all for me through Jesus. That's what we have. That's the good news. Do you know the good news? Can you share it with somebody? If you can't, if you go, I think I need some training. You just got it. <laughs> it's done. The training's done. This will be online. You can listen to it over and over if you want. We, we unnecessarily complicate it many times. Now, did Jesus say once you're part of the family, I've, I've got this whole new way of life for you and you need to learn about it? Yes, that's why we gather. That's why we get together with each other. That's why I go, hey, what did you learn this? What's God teaching you this week? Maybe I can pick up something. And you ask me, what did you learn? Maybe you can pick up something so we can help each other live out the identity that we've been given in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21 says this. All this is from God. Could you say amen? All this is from God. It's not from you and I. Isn't that a great thing It's not from you and I? 
what a mess it would be if it was for me, wouldn't it? Several of you are eager to nod your head. Yes, yes, I think she would. Okay, yeah. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry, us, all of us, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So this morning, we're going to celebrate communion. It's, um, it's going to be a, f we're going to do the normal thing. We're going to have a little cup and a little piece of cracker. That. But then afterwards, we're having a potluck. So it will be a feast. It'll be a little glimpse of what Isaiah and John wrote about and what Jesus gave us a, a glimpse into when he was teaching about the kingdom of God in his parables. We're going to have a feast. We're doing that tonight too out at Christensen's uh, homestead south of town. But I want to get, because I'm up here and I had the floor for a minute, I want to give the invitation as an ambassador it's very possible, it's more than likely. I'm almost certain there's probably people here that aren't yet in God's family. They've never really placed their trust in what Jesus has done, the simple good news about what Jesus has done and made possible for us to have a new identity, to be in God's family, to be his servant, to be his ambassador. They've never done that. In a sense, you're like the person that showed up in Jesus' story with the wrong garments. Like, well, I'm coming to church. Yeah, that doesn't make you right with God. Just because the guy showed up at the wedding feast didn't mean he was allowed to stay. Don't use your own clothing. You have to have the clothing provided by Jesus, his salvation, his forgiveness, the identity that he gives. Don't be a poser. Don't be a person trying to sneak in. And if you haven't made that decision yet, you can do that right now. You can go, boy, that's clear to me now. I'm going to trust what Jesus has done and not me. I'm not going to look at how bad I've been or how good I've been. I'm going to trust just what Jesus has done. Take God at his word. Believe what he said he's provided. And if you have questions about that, there's nothing wrong with having questions, but get them answered. Find somebody who can give you the answers from God's word. And then for those of us that are in the family, that are part of that family of servants who are sent as ambassadors, it's our feast with Jesus, our King. And right now, we're His servants sent as messengers, as ambassadors, with a message and ministry of reconciliation. Are you living your life in light of that? on a daily basis? Don't get sidetracked. Don't go, oh, I, it's Jesus in his story. He says, oh, some of them, you know, had their business. Some of them had their, their property. They had that. That's told in other gospels too. They have all these excuses. And it sounds very similar to things I've heard over the years. Well, I'd, I'd get more involved if my wife, if my husband, if my kids my work. Ah, this is our central identity. We got to live it out. Yes? We need to live it out. I don't do that very well all the time. That doesn't mean I shouldn't keep looking at it and going. And it's okay. I, I have to invite, because our culture is just, we don't do this. We just don't get it very good. If, if I have a problem with you in our culture, you know what I'm most likely to do? Go tell somebody else. It's just the way it works, isn't it? Would you agree? That's often how it works. And so I have, I've learned over the years, because I'm getting old now, I've learned over the years, I have to invite people and, and, and invite them, give them permission, say, hey, if you see me being a donkey, come and tell me. And a lot of them still don't. They just won't because it's just not our culture. We go, oh, I can't, I can't do that. It wouldn't be nice. 
But there's some, I've got a, a handful of people, I just keep reminding them, yeah, I meant it, <laughs> do it. And some of them have done it, and it's, it's a huge blessing to me, it's a help to me, because I really want to live out the identity that I've been given in Jesus, but I still am dealing with problems named Brett, as well as everything else that's going on around. So I want to challenge those of us that are in the family as we come to communion. It, this is going to figure in to what, what God instructs us very clearly. I'm not going to read the instructions. We do that every, every month pretty much, but I want to give a couple things. And so ushers, you might start getting ready. I'll call you up in, in just a moment. But we celebrate what's known as open communion. If, if you have no idea what that means, that's okay. It means you're not very churchy. <laughs> okay. But open communion means this. We're, what we're going to do here with communion, we're going to remember the body and the blood of Jesus, which was given for us so that we could be in God's family. 